Welcome back. Today, we're gonna to pick off where we were last time, go into a little more detail about spinning disks, looking at performance, and then see how this is put together to build file systems where we store all our data. File systems are interesting because traditionally they've been one of the hardest part of the operating system. There's more papers on file systems than pretty much any other topic. And the main tasks for a file system is making sure that we can persist our state, we can store files on disk, and providing us some facilities to help us organize our files, like files names and directories. We can implement file systems with all kinds, between on disk, over the network, in memory, across many machines, on tape, all kinds of things. And in today's lecture, we'll focus mostly on how these files, directories are organized and a little bit about performance by looking at a couple different common file systems you've probably used. Why are disks different and they make this problem an interesting issue is that firstly, we want to make sure that the file system persists state after a crash. So if there's a crash or you power off your computer, you want all your files to be there. So we need to interact with the hardware correctly to ensure that the right IOs are done to disk to store your data in the right order so that all the structures have the correct meaning. And usually the challenge comes about when we do this trade-off when we're trying to make things fast. As we make things fast, we're gonna to have to play interesting tricks to get better performance while still maintaining reliability in face of crashes. The second is that disks are relatively slow to processors. Every year, the disk gets faster by just a few percent while your processor speed doubles every 18 months. And third is the disks are incredibly large. They're usually 100 to 1,000 times larger than memory so we're gonna place most of our data here and we're constantly gonna be accessing data on the disk to do our work. So let's put these performance numbers into perspective. On a spinning disk, we might see somewhere around an eight millisecond average seek time. So our random reads and writes are roughly eight milliseconds per read or write pretty much regardless of size, unless the size is very large in the megabytes. And for sequential performance, we should expect somewhere around 100 to maybe on the faster end about 200 megabytes a second per disk for sequential read and write. And the cost here you can see is, is fairly inexpensive compared to other storage mediums. There are a few cents per gigabyte. Flash and other S flash technologies like SSDs and VME that you might be using on your computer provides a similar model where we have these sector size regions, either 512 or 4 kilobyte, with much faster random read times and random write times, which is great for certain workloads, and sequential writes that are just a little bit faster. The caveat being here that the cost is much higher. You're gonna pay somewhere around an order of magnitude more to store your data on an SSD than you would a spinning disk. So it might make sense for small amounts of data that are accessed very frequently or for certain workloads, but for the bulk of large data storage, it's gonna be a lot cheaper to have large arrays of disks than it is flash. And lastly, we can compare it to the memory on our computer. The memory on our computer is byte oriented. It's really easy to update. It's incredibly fast. Again, orders of magnitude faster than the flash and much, much faster than the disk. And it has incredibly high throughputs. But here the cost is again, much more. You're paying tens of dollars per gigabyte. And this data is volatile. It's not going to survive a crash. Remember that the disk reads and writes that we talked about last time are sector oriented. You modify an entire sector, which typically is 512 or four kilobytes, 
anytime you want to modify something smaller than that, let's say you want to modify a single byte, well, what's going to happen? You're going to read the entire sector, you're going to update that byte, and then you're going to write the entire sector back. If it's already cached, you might not have to read it, but you'll have to modify it and still write an entire sector. You can't really write less than a sector. That's not part of the model of how disks and most flash devices work. Whenever there's a crash, generally we can assume that a sector is going to be written completely or not. We assume this atomicity of writes, that there's enough power in the drive and there's enough mechanical acceleration in the platters to keep the drive spinning to allow the sector to be written entirely or not. This isn't actually quite true, and on a rare occasion, disks and have what are called torn sectors, where the writes are incomplete and the sector is damaged by a partial overwrite. But for the most part, for this lecture, we're gonna ignore that and assume that this is actually correct. Let's look at a few useful trends that we can see that we can use for helping us think about design. The first is that disk bandwidth and the cost per bit are improving exponentially. Similar to CPU speed and memory size and so forth. The second is that the seek time and the rotational delay is improving very slowly. So if we have to pay seeks, we'll see that there isn't really a big improvement because it's, we're moving a physical disk arm over the platter and there's really no way around improving that performance. The third is that disk accesses are a huge system bottleneck and they're getting worse. Remember that we said that the bandwidth is much lower than memory and even though the bandwidth of disks are increasing, they're not increasing nearly as fast, so they're a larger and larger bandwidth bottleneck. And if you're paying latency because of seeks, this gets even worse. The last thing that I wanted to touch on is that desktop memory sizes are increasing faster than typical workloads. For the most part, memory has gotten cheap enough that for most end users, we can basically store most of the important data we need. This isn't true for servers and other environments where the data sets are massively larger than memory, but on, on a desktop, we can kind of assume that a workload will fit entirely in memory, which means we don't have to swap to disk as frequently as we might have in the past. So let's build up an understanding of the set of abstractions that the file system provides. The first abstraction is the notion of a file. The disk, remember, is just a collection of sectors that you can read and write to. But typically, when you're writing code, you're writing just calls to read and write. You're adding bytes of data, overwriting bytes of data, reading a sequence of bytes that you wanna read. You don't wanna think about sectors. You don't wanna think about where they're placed on the disk. So kind of like the hardware MMU does, we're just translating file names and their offset into some address on the disk and then facilitating those read and write operations. So from the user's perspective, I can have a file called foo.c that'll have my code split across one or more sectors and they'll be spread out all over the disk. So the file system's job is to provide these translations and to facilitate the read and write operations required. Often we'll have a set of operations for the file, including creating, deleting files, enumerating files, reading and writing to a file. And we want these operations to be very fast. We want to have as few disk accesses as possible and have minimal space overhead. So similar to the page tables, let's look, look at that example again. The file system is simply a bunch of metadata for translating between a set of mappings. Remember, if you can think back about the virtual memory lecture, the page table maps a virtual page number to a physical page number. The file system usually has a few operations like this. It maps some byte offset 
into an actual block on disk. And this is usually done by something called an inode, which describes the layout of a given file. This is the mappings of that file and a directory, which is usually just a special type of file provides mappings from file name to some kind of file number or usually an inode number. In both the file system and in virtual memory, we basically want to have some kind of location transparency. We don't want the user to know about physical memory. We don't want the user to know about, or the program to know about the layout of the file on disk. We want that to be mostly transparent to them so that they can worry about higher level problems when they're programming. The layout though can have a big performance impact. In some ways, the file system job is easier than virtual memory because the amount of CPU time that you can spend on doing file system mappings and updating mappings is pretty large relative to what you can do for virtual memory. For virtual memory, most things have to be completed in a matter of cycles. The cost of these updates are, in, the cost of interposing on reads and writes to memory is very expensive versus reads and writes to disk. And the second, is that page tables usually have to deal with sparser address spaces and random access patterns, while files tend to be denser, they're almost completely written to or not, and they tend to be more often sequentially accessed. But in some ways, we can think of ways that the file system's job is harder. Each layer of transition, translation is a potential disk access. Each of these disk accesses are very slow. Imagine if we did a bad job and we do a pay an average seek penalty for each disk access. That means every time you try to do a file system operation, it might cost you eight milliseconds. And the second is that space comes at a large premium. Both the caching that you can do in memory and the on-disk size, even though a disk can be large, you re realize that users can fill up that space and so you really don't wanna waste it. And third is really the diversity of workloads and user and software behavior. For example, let's look at one parameter, which is just the range in file sizes. Files can range from a few kilobytes to many gigabytes in size. So let's have some working intuitions here. File system performance is dominated by the number of disk accesses. Say that each access costs, let's say 10 milliseconds. So we've, we've assumed that an average seek penalty is somewhere around there. And if we access the disk roughly a hundred times, that's going to cost us about one second to do this. In contrast, a CPU might do billions of math operations per second in the same amount of time it takes us to do just a hundred IOs. The second is that the access cost is dominated by the movement and not the transfer. So we mentioned this last time that the cost for a disk here, we're showing the total cost for an access is the seek time, the time it takes to put the head, disk head in the right place on disk, the rotational delay, the amount of time it takes for the disk platter to rotate into position, and roughly the amount of data transferred divided by the disk bandwidth. So if your disk, if you're trying to transfer one sector, well, if we seek somewhere around halfway between the, the maximum of the 10 milliseconds, then our seek time will be around five milliseconds. Our rotational delay is determined by how fast the disk is spinning. And here, we're just assuming that the disk platter has to rotate around halfway on average to access the data. And it comes out to somewhere around four millisecond for this per particular disk. And the third is the amount of time it takes to transfer. 
If we're only reading one sector, that's roughly 512 bytes, and we can read about 100 megabytes a second out of the disk. So it becomes about five microseconds of actual time reading data off the platter and transferring it to the get, to the operating system. So we see that most of the time is from the mechanical movement. It's about nine milliseconds in this example I'm using. Now, what happens if I try to read 50 sectors? Well, the first two parameters are roughly the same. It's just the seek time and the rotational delay. And the third is the number of bytes versus the disk divided by the disk bandwidth. Here, 50 sectors, it's just 50 times the previous five microseconds. It's about a quarter of a millisecond. So I read 50 times more data with only 3% overhead. So ideally, we'd like to read as much useful data as possible in a single I.O. to reduce the overhead of those seeks. Right, if I were to have two workloads, one that read one sector at a time and one that read 50 sectors at a time, well, I'd get roughly a 50 times speed up because I'm paying only a few percent more for each I.O. The caveat here is that things aren't always clear cut. Some workloads are gonna be randomly reading different sectors off the disk, and some workloads are gonna be more sequential. So we'd like to identify those sequential workloads and do a good job of reading more data when possible. The second is that we wanna make sure that when we lay data out on disk, we want things to look sequential. So it's easy to deal with this and make this optimization by reading more data. This here assumes that we read 50 sectors contiguously on disk that are physically laid out one after another. In order for us to do this, we need to make sure that the file system is placing blocks contiguously on disk. So there are a few op observations from this that might be helpful. The first is that blocks in a file tend to be used sequentially. And this also relates generally, more generally, to some of the themes we've seen throughout the previous lectures of locality. That there's gonna be some kind of spatial locality in the files where we're gonna use blocks that are near other blocks on, in a file roughly around the same time. Also, we get the same kind of locality when we start looking at the structure of the file system itself. Normally, when you open a directory, you're likely to use a bunch of files within that same directory. That means that all files within a directory also tend to be used together. So there are a few main addressing patterns that we'll find in file systems. And there are three here. The first is the sequential access pattern that file data is accessed sequentially from the beginning of the file to the end of the file. This is common with editors, compilers, a lot of data processing and so forth. The random access pattern where we might address random blocks within a file. Here, this is more common with databases or paging from virtual memory. And then third, is the keyed access pattern, where we'll search for blocks with particular values. So again, you can think of this as a database or certain other data structures that'll do this kind of operation. This is usually not provided directly by the OS. There have been OSs that do this, but typically this is provided by some kind of library on top of it. So this brings us to the main part of the file system lecture, where we're going to start understanding how a few file systems are laid out. And the problem here is we want to manage the disk. We want to track where all the file contents are on the disk. We want to be able to map an, a byte offset to an actual disk block. And the structure that typically does this, that deals with where a file's data is, is usually referred to as an inode. And inodes themselves need to be stored on disks. 
And then second is that we should keep in mind when designing the file structure some of our basic intuitions. One, that most files are small. This is a nice intuition that when we talk about the fast file system, the fast file system made a lot of these nice observations that helped them design a much better file system over the original Unix file system. There's a reference to this paper later in the lecture, which you can see, and there's obviously the follow-up work, which built the log structured file system, which you're gonna read as part of one of your reading assignments. Most of the disk space is allocated to large files. And third, many of the IO operations are also gonna be made to large files. We wanna be able to have good sequential and random access to support both of these common access patterns. So let's start with a few ways that file systems have been built and look at a few different ideas and we'll see examples of file systems that do this. The first is a straw man, which is this contiguous allocation where we're gonna allocate files kind of like segmented memory and we just place every file has a pointer to the files base address and its length within the disk. So here the inode all it contains is the first sector and the number of sectors in that given file. This makes it really easy to do sequential and random access because we can simply look at the base find the offset and read the relevant sectors. There are older file systems that have used this scheme, including IBM's OS 360. But what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is that often we're gonna find files, files might grow. And so if we wanna insert a file C here, that's two blocks, well, there's no way to have a single contiguous extent so we need to move file B around or file A to make space for file C. We're essentially getting external fragmentation, just like in virtual memory. So this brings us to another way that we could build the file system. And this is used by DOS, the DOS FAT file system. So if you recall, most of you on your computers, when you format a USB key, is gonna use the FAT file system. And there are several variations of the FAT file system. The first, the earlier versions, FAT 12, 16, and 32, look a lot like this. Where basically, on disk, we use a linked list. We have an allocation table. This is where the FAT file system gets its name. FAT stands for the file allocation table. And it's basically the set of entries within the table that describes free memory and used memory. And that memory is used to form linked lists. When you find file A, it just tells you the start of the file. And to continue finding the file, you look and you find the linked lists that the file blocks are linked through, and you follow the linked list along in order to read the data. This means that you're not gonna necessarily get good performance for sequential IO if the disk blocks are all over the place and random accesses mean that you have to follow down the linked list to find the block you care about. But the nice thing with this scheme is that it's really easy to grow and shrink files and sequential access isn't too bad because you can follow the linked list along. Now we should know that the latest version of the FAT file system is sometimes referred to as XFAT doesn't actually use this scheme anymore because of the drawbacks of this. So in the FAT file system, basically there are two main structures, directories and the FAT structure, the file allocation table. The FAT structure is where we allocate mem blocks from, and it's also where the linked list itself is stored. So if we go to the root directory of the file system, we'd see these two files, A and B, and A will just have a pointer to 
file allocation table offset six, and B has a pointer to file fat allocation table offset uh, two. So A here, you start at six, you look in the file allocation table and you'll see that it says four. That means that the next block after six is four. And then after block four, it says three. So you go to three and you read three and you see that three refers to the end of file. The nice thing here is that this table is usually relatively small. So it's easier to put large portions of it in memory. And then you just walk the linked list there rather than waiting for the IOs for individual files. Imagine if the linked list was co-located with the data, I'd read block six, and then I would know I can read block four. With the fat structure, we might be able to see that, oh, I need to read block six, four, and three, and they're all close together. So why don't I just read three and four together and I read six? We can do that because the file location table is gonna be cached in memory, allowing the file system to use better structures on more modern OSs to make the fat file system a little faster. You still have to do some pointer chasing, but this fat table in many cases can be cached in memory because it's relatively small and it's compact. So here we have a FAT file system with 16 bits. If you ever see FAT 12, 16, and 32, this is just referring to the number of bits for each entry in the FAT table. The modern XFAT doesn't look like this. It actually looks like the FAST file system later in the lecture. So in a FAT 16 file system, what's the maximum size for the FAT table? Well, that's two to the 16, or 64,000 entries. If we assume a 512 byte block, then we can calculate what the maximum size of the entire file system is. It can only represent a 32 megabyte file system. You just multiply the 64K times 512 bytes to get the total size for the disk. So there, one solution we can do to increase the size is to just use larger blocks. The thing is, are your files actually bigger or not? And the second is to add more bits to the FAT table. Same way that they did the FAT32, they just doubled the number of bits. The space overhead for the file allocation table is pretty nice because it's roughly two bytes for every 512 byte block. It's 0.4%. The problems though here really come with reliability. And the way that the FAT file system solves reliability is that it actually stores duplicate copies of the FAT. It usually stores two copies at different points in the disk that contain the linked list because if the linked list get corrupted when they're being written to disk, if you can't, if you're, a file's link list spans multiple sectors, you can't write them atomically, then you might actually corrupt and lose track of some of the files. So the way to deal with this is to have two copies so you can write one and then write the other. And that way, one of them will have the full description of a file. And the third is how do we deal with the root directory? And so in the FAT file system, the layout is pretty much fixed. There's two file allocation tables and a root directory, and then all the files consume all the blocks after that. So let's look at a few more straw man designs that we can use to think about how we can manage files on disk. The next is to sort of split up the file allocation table by having instead of linked lists, we can have arrays of pointers to point to disk blocks. And that way, the max file size is just defined by this array and that array points to all the blocks on disk so we can read in an array for a given file and we can basically call this the inode and it's gonna contain pointers to all the blocks on disk and we can easily access all the blocks through this method. This is really nice because this array mechanism makes it easy to do sequential and random access, but storing the arrays 
might require a lot of contiguous space on disk if the files are very large. So it's kind of the same problem we've been trying to solve. So we can take an idea from page tables and think about what happens if we did a hierarchical structure. We could have fixed size arrays, arrays that point to other arrays to describe large files. The only downside with this idea of just using a radix tree to store files is that for very small files, which are common, we're gonna still have to navigate down this radix tree. So you might only read a four kilobyte file, but issue multiple four kilobyte reads across the radix tree to find those blocks. So this still has a downside, a performance downside. So one of the nice ideas that was introduced by the early BSD file system is the idea of having a multi-level indexed file. So the inode no longer is just an array to pointers of a fixed number of, of levels. Instead, most of the pointers inside of a fixed size block point directly to data blocks. This means that small files, usually into the few kilobyte range or tens of kilobyte range, can contain data directly pointed to by the inode, requiring no extra block accesses. Medium-sized files will have a pointer dedicated for indirect blocks, allowing larger files to exist. And even larger files can have double indirect blocks, where they'll point to indirect blocks that point to the actual data, and so forth. The idea here is making, making a preference for really small files. Remember that we kind of noticed when we look at the file system that files tend to be at the extreme in sizes. They have a wide range, but many files are small. And then we have some large files that are accessed as well. So here we have 14 block pointers in the inode and the first 12 of them are dedicated for small files. If our block size was four kilobytes, then it would be four kilobytes times 12 or 48 kilobytes for a small file that doesn't require any indirect or double indirect blocks. Medium sized files that have another set of pointers are gonna get another 128 blo blocks by just reading that indirect block. And very large files the cost of the double indirect block will be amortized across all the IOs that might be done. This scheme is really simple and easy to build, and it provides good performance for small files. And you still have a maximum file length, but it's very large. What are the downsides? Well, the downsides are that in the worst case, we might have to access the inode and then the double indirect and the indirect block before accessing a data block. So we might require, we can assume that the inode is usually cached and we might require two IOs for every actual data IO. And what is the space overhead here? Well, for a small file, we have the inode block, which is usually gonna be the size of a data block, similar size to a data block. We have the inode block, and we can have those set of indirect blocks that are wasting space. So in a 13 block file where we just overflow and need the first indirect block, we're consuming one block of indirect blocks, one block for the inode, and we have 13 blocks of data. So it's quite a bit higher the space overhead than the DOS FAT file system, but it comes off with these performance trade-offs. And the last problem, which comes out from actual use and looking at performance of a system, is that the file system found free blocks basically through a free list and through bitmaps and other data structures. This means that over time, the file blocks can be thrown all over the disk. We'd like to have a sequential access pattern whenever possible to get better performance. So we need some way to organize the space better and relate space to files. 
to get better performance. <clears throat> so this brings us to thinking about the overall structure of the file system on disk and how it's laid out. In the original Unix file systems and the early BSD file system, the disk structure was fairly fixed. The beginning was known as the super block, which describes the layout of the entire disk. And then there'd be a large array of inodes. So we, already, we have a problem here that there's a fixed number of these inodes. And then the remainder of the disk is actual data blocks and the inodes point to it. So every time I do an IO, I'm basically going back and forth. Imagine I wanna read all the files in a directory. Well, I have to read the directory inode, read the blocks that describe the directory, come back to each file's inode, and then read its data blocks, and I'm going back and forth, and I'm paying basically an average seek on each iteration. So that translates to roughly 100 to 200 operations per second that I can do. Imagine I'm extracting a million files. Well, I'm only gonna be able to extract 100 files per second of small files. One of the evolutions of the BSD file system, known as the fast file system, is that instead it split out the sec inode array all over the disk. So that the idea is that we'd like to co-locate the inodes with the data blocks belonging to those files near each other to reduce the seek overhead. This means that we're making a smaller seek and it's gonna be much faster than an average seek. Remember, in the top case, we expect an average seek, which is roughly eight milliseconds. In the bottom case, by splitting up the disk into small groups of inodes and data blocks, we cut this time down because this might just be the settlement time and rotational delay, which is gonna be roughly a millisecond. The Unix file system basically evolved through various OSs that predate it and the early versions of Unix to describe a file system that has a single namespace starting with the root directory. In fact, when you mount other disks, those file systems are just mounted and accessed through that single namespace as well. So here in the example, you can see slash CD-ROM, which is where our CD will get mounted, and the CD-ROM file system will be accessed through the same namespace as the root file system and any other file system. The other nice thing is that directories are basically just files. They're just blocks of data that describe the name mappings, and they're just special files. They have a flag so that the file system knows that it's in charge of this file, and you can't directly write and modify a directory. So only special system calls like creating files, deleting files, and linking files are allowed to modify the directory to make sure that an abusive user doesn't damage the directory structure of the file system. And here we have a mapping from a name to an inode number. The directory, when you read it, and in some systems you can still read the raw directory structure, all it is is the file name and an inode number of that file that you can then go and open. When you call open, the file system just navigates the directory structure, scanning for each path within it, and doing this recursively until it finds the file that you're trying to open. This gives you a nice hierarchical structure for us to organize and keep all of our data. There are a few other things that we have. First is that in most Unix style file systems, inode two, rather than reserving a physical location on disk, we reserve an inode number for the root directory. And inode number two is where the root directory is held. Inodes zero and one are historically reserved. And the second is that for every directory, we have some special entries. One, the slash name is always refers to the root of the file system and dot refers to the current directory and dot dot to the parent directory. 
And there's also special names that are not implemented as part of the file system, but are often there as usability that are implemented by the shell or libraries. So one is the user's home directory. If you do tilde slash, it means you're giving a path relative to your home directory. Or when you see you run a command with, you know, foo.star to find all files that start with foo, this is usually provided to you by your shell that'll pattern match for that path that you've described. Let's look at a case study of speeding up the original Unix file system and go into a little more detail, putting together some of these ideas that we've seen. The original Unix file system, as we described earlier, has a super block that describes the file system layout, the size of the disk, the block sizes, all the information about the disk. It has a fixed size region for inodes and the remainder of the disk as 512 byte blocks for data. The components here are basically the data blocks, those inodes, and support for hard links in the file system, and the super block that describes all this file system made data and where it is and how to start. The problem here was that this file system was really slow, especially as disks started getting faster, we'd get usually only about 2% of the maximum disk throughput. We'd see somewhere around 20 kilobytes per second relative to a disk that should be getting many times that. On these early disks, it would have been somewhere around tens of megabytes per second. And there's a lot of reasons for the performance cost. The first is that blocks were too small. The 512 byte blocks is fine if all our files were 512 bytes, it would make efficient use of the space, but we'll find that block files might be a little larger than that on average, and that the file index gets too large to deal with large files, making for a very low transfer rate. The second is that objects are not closely related together. Remember the intuitions we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Consecutive blocks might be spread out all over the disk, so reading sequentially a file might not be sequential anymore. The inodes can be far from the data blocks because the inodes are at the beginning of the disk, the data blocks are all over the rest of the disk. So we'll be paying an average seek penalty often going back and forth. The inodes for a given directory are also not necessarily close together, right? We read a directory and we wanna read all the files in that directory. Well, all of those files, their inodes are not necessarily in a contiguous region on inside of the inode region. They might be spread out randomly within the inode region. And this basically, all of this culminates in poor performance whenever we want to enumerate lots of objects. I do grep and I search for a string within a group of files or just archiving, tarring files up to create an archive or to extract an archive. And lastly, there were a bunch of usability problems in the early Unix file system. File names were limited to just 14 characters and we couldn't update file names in a way that could survive a crash of the file system. So the fast file system, so this is, was written by McCusick which we mentioned in previous lectures. And we can see how he built a better file system by understanding these intuitions and looking and analyzing the system itself. So the first thing he looked at was looking at internal fragmentation and deciding what's the right block size. So why shouldn't we just make blocks bigger? We wanna find a nice trade-off here. So what he did was enumerate different block sizes by studying a bunch of disks on, on multiple computers, looking at how much space would be wasted if I change the block size, and examining the potential maximum bandwidth we could achieve. The bigger block size obviously should give us better bandwidth, but it's gonna waste more space. So 
the idea and the intuition he came up with is to split the unused portion of a file. So let's say that we took a 4096 bit byte block. Most of the time we're wasting half of it. What we could do is split that block up into a set of fragments, allowing us to use portions of a block for the for small files or for the ends of files. So the fast file system in the first version had a much larger block size, either four kilobyte or eight kilobyte was typical. And blocks could be split into eight fragments. So here we're showing two files, file A, that's a large file. And the end of that file is a tiny fragment, a tiny bit of space that would otherwise be wasted. We can stick that as a fragment in a block and share that with file B, that's a tiny file itself that's less than a, much less than a block size. This is a nice trade-off that allowed him to achieve better performance for larger files and still get better space usage by splitting large blocks into multiple smaller blocks. While it would be nice to have variable size splits, to make things very simple, FFS used fixed size fragments of a kilobyte or two kilobytes. The second nice innovation is thinking about the physical spinning disk and how we can lay out data on the disk to get better efficiency. Remember that switching Moving the disk head from one end of the disk to the other is most of our cost for seek time. Switching between platters was relatively cheap. So th the idea he came up with is this idea of a cylinder group. He groups a group of one or more cylinders that are close together and he uses that as a region of the disk that everything related should be in. That the, there'll be a separate pool of inodes and data blocks and directories will all be co-located within that cylinder group. The idea here is to get physical locality on the disk by having a better layout in the file system. I should point out at this point that in older disks, if you can recall, I mentioned this last time, we had cylinder head sector addressing where the disk, the operating system was aware of the cylinder layout and the sector layout on disk. In fact, in the early versions of FFS, FFS even considered the rotational delay to make better decisions about the layout and could do some measurements to optimize the parameters it used for laying out data on disk. On a modern system, you just approximate this by using consecutive sectors in regions split based on rough size. If we roughly use 1% of the disk, well, our disk seek should be very minimal. It should just be a small realignment of the head. The second thing is that FFS did a much better job with allocation. It tried to ensure that file blocks are placed sequentially on disk. So it provided ways to search for blocks. It used a bitmap so that it could figure out whether blocks nearby are available. And similarly, it also did the same idea for inodes, allowing it to maintain as much sequential performance when accessing files or iterating through directories. So let's put this together to see how the high level picture looks like. FFS makes a lot of improvements for reliability, not all of which we can go into today, but I would encourage you to look at the paper to understand all of the issues that it solved. Here, we're showing a picture of the disk layout. What we see here is that the logical addresses have been split into five groups, cylinder groups, where each cylinder group has a super block. It has some extra information like the free bitmap and other information 
for helping us deal with the file system, a pool of inodes and data blocks. So each cylinder group roughly looks like the way that the Unix file system looks, except with better data structures for allocation. In reality, most disks will have much more than five cylinder groups. You could have hundreds to thousands of cylinder groups to split up the disk into small slivers that are all very close together physically on the disk to reduce those disk seeks. And the space was managed through a simple algorithm. When I create files belonging in the same directory, I tried to co-locate those new files in the same cylinder group. When I grow a file, I try to grow the file by allocating data blocks within the same cylinder group. When files grow large, large files, we don't want large files to fill up a given cylinder group. So when a file grows over a megabyte in size, then we, we select a different cylinder group for the remainder of the file. This way, large files get load balanced across all of the cylinder groups and small files tend to be co-located with their directory. When we create new directories, we also select a different cylinder group. This gave us a nice way of spreading data across the disk when we change directories or when we access very large files where we are willing to pay the penalty of a seek, but gives us good locality for small files where all the files and all the inodes within the same directory are all co-located within a single cylinder group. The older Unix system and DOS, remember, use a link list basically to manage free space. And it, it's pretty easy to allocate because we can pop off the link list and push to the link list when we free blocks. But it's bad because this free link list becomes very fragmented over time and it makes it very hard to find adjacent blocks. So FFS switched this data structure to a bitmap. It allowed very fast scanning for blocks by just scanning for bits that are set to zero. And it's usually small enough to be stored in memory. And it also allowed us to scan for blocks that are close to a file. So if I have file a file and I'm growing that file, Rather than just finding the first block that's free, I'll find the first block that's close to the end of the file. That way, hopefully, I can keep the file sequential in access pattern. Remember that the bitmap is very small, allowing us to keep it in memory. So if we had a four gigabyte disk and we had four kilobyte blocks, We'd only have a million bits divided by eight gives us a 128 kilobyte bitmap, which isn't a lot of space and can be stored in memory on most machines. It allows us to efficiently ask all kinds of questions to get better efficiency for allocation. We can allocate blocks that are close to another block in a file to give us almost sequential behavior, either after or before. And if the disk is almost empty, we're more likely to find one near the end of the file. As the disk becomes full, it gets harder and more expensive to find free blocks. So another clever idea that the file system did was that it actually hid a little bit of the disk space from the computer. It tells the user, you tell the user that you only have 90% of the disk space available. 10% of the disk space would be reserved. The only user who's allowed to use the remaining 10% is the root user who's usually gonna use this to be able to find some files to free up, tar them up and move them off the disk or copy them to another disk. So for normal users, they could only use 90% of the free space within the disk and this extra 10% was enough to facilitate keeping good allocation decisions. So what do we gain out of this design? Well, we get a bunch of performance improvements that allowed us to use somewhere around 20 to 40% of the disk bandwidth for large files, which is 10 to 20 times the original Unix file system. 
And we got better small file performance because of locality on the file system. Is the best we can do? No. A lot of file systems have tried to improve this. And some of these are trade-offs depending what we're trying to achieve. The XFS file system from SGI uses an extent-based structure where we have a tree of extents that describes the entire file. This makes it easy to describe very large files with very few entries, reducing the number of indirection blocks and giving better sequential performance. And lastly, the writes of metadata are done synchronously in this system, and that hurt the small file performance a lot because every time we update the file, we'll update the inode, and making these things a little more costly. And there are a few improvements that the fast file system makes later on that allows it to get better performance. The first was to allow for more asynchronous writing, have IOs in flight that are out of order in order to get better performance. But we still need to achieve correctness in our file system. And to be able to achieve correctness, we had to introduce new mechanisms. So there are two nice mechanisms that are introduced. One is soft updates. And a second technique that most other file systems use is journaling or logging. In the most modern versions of the fast file system, we actually have a hybrid approach, which is called soft updates plus journaling that uses soft updates to eliminate the right ordering problems from these asynchronous writes. And it uses journaling to deal with some of the limitations of soft updates and giving us the best of both worlds. Today, we got to see an overview of file systems and look at some of the optimizations that have been done to make better use of spinning disks. We can see that these optimizations, optimizing for the realities of the hardware we're running on, are things that we do throughout the OS and applications all the time. And as hardware continues to evolve, these optimizations evolve. For SSDs, we're making a different set of trade-offs. So file systems, again, are being optimized for these things. 